but his life was turned upside down when his skin made contact with that man's hand. He was cold, not like a regular old man with circulation problems. No, he was deadly cold. If you want to go behind the scenes of this episode and access the original recording of the interview I conducted with the person telling their story, you can join my Patreon-exclusive access tier. Also, adult colouring books are a great way to relieve stress, and coupled with listening to this podcast, it could be the perfect way to unwind. I have just released my very first cryptid adult colouring book, which is available on Amazon in physical format, or Etsy as a downloadable PDF. Links will be included in the descriptions. Some people might think that believers of the supernatural are more prone to experience unexplainable things, as if they actively seek out that kind of traumatic incident, or that's their preferred way to explain every questionable happening in their lives. However, others might argue that non-believers are much more likely to end up as victims of the most extraordinary and uncanny events. Maybe their pride makes them a compelling challenge. Perhaps their blissful ignorance of the threats beyond our comprehension turns them into perfect targets. There's a chance that they just boldly avoid every warning sign and step with their heads held high into devilish traps, haunted spots, and cursed territories. Either way, there's a very fascinating witness from the state of Tennessee that can speak of having his entire view of the world as well as the laws of logic, life, and death, getting completely transformed by his life adjacent to supernatural cases. This story belongs to a man named Benjamin, who moved from Washington to Tennessee around the age of 15. Not once suspecting that his entire belief system would soon be challenged to hell and back. Benjamin was raised in a household of Protestant faith, and he didn't consider himself to be a believer in anything that went beyond things observable and explainable, logical and scientifically proven facts. When Benjamin got out of high school, he didn't believe in ghosts, demons or anything similar. But also, he was in desperate need of a job. In an ideal world, Benjamin would have gotten a job as a graphic designer, saved money until he started college, and gone on with his life without any substantial trauma or life-changing experiences. But, as it happened, the graphic designer job fell through, and Benjamin scrambled for a well-paid alternative. Unfortunately for him, he found just the right job to change his life. It's been said that, in this old planet we inhabit, Humans have lived long enough in so many places that it's practically impossible to find a place in most cities where somebody has never died. Most places in the world, especially those that have been the battleground for bloodthirsty wars and the stage for plagues, cruelty and discrimination, can be easily and most probably haunted. Tennessee isn't the exception. This Southern American state has plenty of famous landmarks that are supposedly haunted. It should come as no surprise that some businesses specialised in offering interactive, informative, deeply entertaining and oftentimes unnerving tours along the best eerie spots in their part of the city. This is where Benjamin found a job, and that's where his struggle with supernatural forces began. At first, the job didn't seem like the best bet for a highly sceptical young man like Benjamin. But working one or two hours a night for about $30 an hour was the encouragement he needed. The job itself wasn't so difficult. He got to learn much more about the city, meet hundreds of people, earn plenty of tips, and usually have a good time. The stories were quite interesting, considering that a big chunk of them had an entirely made-up plot. Some were heavily embellished, but a good portion of them was all true. Or, well, allegedly true, as Benjamin used to remind himself, even in the privacy of his own thoughts. Not only did he not believe in the supernatural, but he didn't want to believe in it. He wanted to avoid it at all costs 
And yet, he couldn't run away from his job and the challenges that it would send his way. Similarly, the tour through the haunted landmarks of the city that Benjamin had to repeat most nights, his life went through a transformative path in the several months that he worked with that company. For a space of about two years, Benjamin's life changed in unimaginable ways. He experienced all kinds of odd, unsettling, alarming, and even truly terrifying experiences, like stops on his own private demonic tour. Benjamin's mind opened up to a new hell of possibilities. He went from sceptical to doubting his convictions, and was eventually convinced that the world he lived in wasn't quite what he used to believe. But before he got there, first, he had to experience every single one of these terrors. At the beginning of each tour, Benjamin would hand EMF meters to every person in the group. These little handheld devices are meant to detect electromagnetic fields in the environment. Some people disregarded them as cheap toys copied from scary movies, or, at best, something useful for anything but detecting actual ghosts. Others carried them with conviction and respect, admiring them as powerful and meaningful tools. Benjamin avoided both extremes and took a logical approach, appreciating them as part of the entertainment of the tour. Or, at least, he did that at first, before he had to witness the full depth of those instruments' power. It was a night just like any other, and the tour went smoothly all the way until the end, which, appropriately, happened at an eerie graveyard. Benjamin was giving his last words to the clients when one of them experienced a problem with his EMF meter. It was quite unusual, so Benjamin moved quickly toward him and discovered that a man claimed his EMF meter completely stopped working when he passed by a certain grave. That really caught Benjamin's attention. The devices could switch through six lights from red to green to signal an electromagnetic frequency but turning off entirely and then switching back up just one foot away, completely unprompted? Benjamin had never seen anything like it. Naturally, this caught the attention of everybody present, and soon enough, the entire group gathered around the grave, crouching in front of the gravestone, trying to read the name. The tension was growing and growing, the air was cold, the night seemed to darken. It was a really old grave, the words were almost entirely gone. They managed to read the word Thomas. They mumbled it again and again, but they couldn't make sense of the barely there letters of the last name until someone yelled it. Wiley! A man yelled loudly. Everyone in the group turned around quickly to see who had managed to read it. But none of them did. There was nobody else behind them. The voice didn't come from the group. The voice didn't come from any explainable and understandable source that wasn't directly from the grave of Thomas Wiley. Most regular people can experience an unnerving scare of that kind and be able to shake it off and go on with their lives. Benjamin certainly tried to look past that strange event, continue giving his best as a tour guide, and remained sceptical about everything he saw and talked about. Sure, maybe he started leaving flowers in Thomas Wiley's grave so he never had to hear that screech from beyond the grave ever again. But he could justify that. Probably. Unfortunately, every night it became harder and harder to ignore certain things, especially when some of them just creeped out from out of nowhere to mark his life and those of every unlucky witness in the area. Back at the beginning of his time working as a tour guide, Benjamin, still a sceptic, didn't fear anything. Not ghosts, not demons, and even less so his own clients. People were mostly fun, only occasionally causing him actual trouble. And every time they got seriously scared, they gave him a good tip. 
By the time this happened, Benjamin was used to shaking hands with middle-aged or old men that discreetly passed their tips that way. He gladly shook hands with almost every person at the end of the tours. But one of them, one particular man, was a special case, in the absolutely worst possible way. This man was some sort of nightmare since the tour began. He wasn't exactly a problem to handle, he was the grandfather accompanying a married couple and a little girl. But his questions... That man asked questions that made Benjamin shiver and genuinely regret taking up that job. Most people usually asked him about how a ghost looked or what they did. But this man was far more interested in the details before whatever monster turned into a ghost or doomed his victims to haunt certain places. He wanted to know about the type of knives, the shape of the bullet wounds, the amount of blood splattered on the floor, the weight of the limbs torn from a body, all the gore and all the cruelty of all the worst stories of Benjamin's repertoire. By the time the tour ended, Benjamin was glad to shake this strange man's hand, take his tip and move on. But his life was turned upside down when his skin made contact with that man's hand. He was cold. Not like a regular old man with circulation problems. No, he was deadly cold. Right out of the freezer. Straight from the morgue. Benjamin repressed a chill and quickly pulled his hand back. That's when he realized he wasn't holding regular dollar bills. Far from it. In his hand was a handful of really unusual silver coins. Benjamin immediately turned around to face the man that just walked past him, but he couldn't find him. Benjamin had never been so dumbfounded in his life. It couldn't be real. The cemetery where the tour ended was on a hill of about 300 yards. No one could run fast enough to be out of sight in seconds. More unsettled than he cared to admit, Benjamin returned to the other members of the group to inquire about the eccentric grandfather, but they confessed that the man was not part of their group. He was already there when they arrived, and he greeted their little girl by her real name, even though they had never met. The family left quickly after that conversation. They didn't want to know more. They didn't want to know about the way Benjamin thought the old man looked like the girl's father, as if he could plausibly be an ancestor. But they didn't leave a tip, which was unfortunate, because Benjamin found out that he was in possession of silver coins that weren't legal currency and seemed to be hundreds of years old. By this point, Benjamin wasn't so sure of his belief on the subject of the supernatural anymore. He still felt safe in his job, and he refused to be scared, but there were just things impossible to deny or ignore anymore. Everything felt different. Everything was far more serious, and he started second-guessing everything he saw and everything he talked about during the tours. One particular popular spot of the tour was an old abandoned cabin that had historical significance for the city. It was built by a single mother with her bare hands for her eight children. Security kept the cabin locked to avoid vandalism, but it was all too easy for tour guides to just stand beside the cabin and make up a whole creepy story about the family's background and the ghost of this old woman pacing inside the cabin back and forth. After all, scared people tipped better. Even the picture on the sign at the front was a lie. The matriarch died long before witnessing the technology of modern photography, but it was said that her great-granddaughter looked extremely similar to her. So, with the right clothes, it was easy to take a picture and make everyone believe that was the original woman for years and years. Except for the day when Benjamin stopped by the cabin with a group that included a very bold kid around 13 years old that was trying so hard to pretend like he wasn't scared. The kid stepped up to Benjamin 
and bravely demanded to know who was the woman in the costume. Benjamin wasn't exactly happy to admit the woman in the photograph was actually the great-granddaughter of the woman from the legend wearing really old clothes. But that wasn't the end of it. The little kid empathetically shook his head and dragged Benjamin away from the sign out front and toward one of the windows of the cabin. Who is she? Who's the woman in the costume? The boy asked again and again, more and more unsettled, as he pointed at the window. Benjamin felt his heartbeat picking up and his palms sweating. He had no idea what to tell this kid. Inside the cabin, the completely abandoned and secured locked cabin, there was an old woman. It was an elderly woman sitting on a rocking chair, slowly rocking back and forth, not moving a muscle. With her white hair a mess, her white nightgown worn down, her skin all wrinkled, and, thankfully, looking at some random spot in the wall instead of facing the window. Benjamin did his best to drag the kid away from the window before he could go into hysterics. It might have been good for business, but, fairly speaking, Benjamin couldn't just let someone sneak into the cabin. He guessed it was probably a homeless woman that broke into the little house looking for safety. As soon as the tour was over, he returned to the cabin to double check and prepare to call his superiors or the police or anyone responsible for the upkeep of that historical landmark. Nothing could have prepared Benjamin for what he felt the moment that he stepped in front of that window again and discovered the truth. There was no one inside. There wasn't even a rocking chair. He gripped the bars of the window tightly as he felt his mind slipping away from him. It took him that long to realize there had never been a rocking chair in the cabin at all. No woman, no chair, no explanation that fits into the rules of logic and reason. He couldn't keep holding on to his skepticism anymore. Most importantly, he had to run away from that cabin before its rival owner had decided to pay another visit and caught him on her property. At the end of the day, Benjamin wasn't sure if his change of mind made him better or worse at his job. He felt much more aware of all the stories he told and all the presences around him. He questioned his beliefs, his job, and every shadow and strange sound that trailed after him during the tours. He also tried to be a little more aware of his clients. Maybe he was more protective of them. Maybe he felt like at any moment he could just as easily get dragged down his own tour like a spectator instead of the person in charge. Either way, he didn't think he'd ever be so caught off guard by some irregularity in his groups. On this occasion, it was a bachelorette party. It wasn't completely unusual, really. It was a fun group of drunk women making a stop at some attraction before moving to the next bar in the city. Benjamin greeted the group, passed them five EMF meters, and got them started. It was a pretty regular group. They had plenty of fun, they screamed a lot, and all of them seemed to be having a lot of fun together all the way until the end. Since it was a sort of rowdy group, Benjamin made it a point to count the number of heads at every stop, not wishing to lose one of them along the road and cause some trouble for anyone involved. After a full hour of counting five heads at every turn, Benjamin was thoroughly taken by surprise at the very end of the tour, when only four women were standing with him. He promptly asked them about their missing friend, but the women insisted there were only ever four of them in the first place. Benjamin felt like he was losing his mind. He double-checked everything. He had been completely sure he gave them five EMF readers and only got four of them in return. But there was not a single one missing from the inventory. The registration book only had four names in there. Nobody could confirm there was ever another woman with them. 
but Benjamin was so sure he saw them all laughing together. Not a single one of them looked like an outsider. He could still feel her staring at him, laughing, smiling, disappearing without a trace. Benjamin's life was completely changed from when he started the job. He was almost an unrecognizable man. Gone were the days of skepticism and the passionate denial of all things supernatural. He had lived for too long and too close to ghosts and spirits that haunted that state. He had to keep living and push down his fears. But he had to accept that the world he lived in was just one part of the full reality around him. Sometimes he hated it. He felt gaslighted and betrayed by his own mind. Sometimes he accepted gladly, and he felt fascinated by the possibilities of the strange incidents around him. Either way, it was all unavoidable. When everything turned out to be too overwhelming, when he felt too tired after a long day of work, or when he finished early and wasn't ready to walk back home, Benjamin walked to a secret spot. Near the end of the tour, a set of stairs would lead him down to a river, and he could sit on the edge of it and enjoy the quiet night around him. Sometimes there were fishermen, already trying their luck before the sun rose, or homeless men desperate to catch some dinner. Benjamin was sitting on the edge of the river, trying to clear his thoughts and calm down his racing heart after yet another tour that defied all his reasonable beliefs. He became aware of a fisherman nearby, and he was polite enough to greet him, but the man seemed to take it as an invitation to move closer and start a conversation with Benjamin. At first, Benjamin was reluctant, but soon enough the two of them were exchanging ghost stories and spending a pleasant time together. Eventually, though, the man walked away. Benjamin was lost in his thoughts and the memories of every creepy story the man shared, when he realized his new friend had left his fishing rod behind, abandoned on the edge of the river. Benjamin moved to pick it up thinking he could try to run up the stairs and see if he could catch him. But that was when he noticed something odd. The fishing rod didn't even have a string, bait, or anything useful at all. That man wasn't fishing. He was just pretending. That fact alone would have been odd, but it became blatantly terrifying considering the story that the man himself had told Benjamin just a few minutes ago. It was an unsettling story about a dead fisherman, a man that drowned in his beloved river and was unable to move away from it, repeatedly returning to his old spot in hopes of finally catching a fish. And yet, he never, never did. Why, Benjamin wondered, why didn't he ever catch a fish? And the man smiled knowingly and simply replied, well, because he was a ghost, obviously. This story was written by Danny Rahel Nieto and narrated by me, James Deverell. Thank you for watching this video. Again, if you enjoyed it, please don't forget to hit the like button and if you don't already, subscribe to my channel. I have just launched the podcast version of this YouTube channel on all major podcast platforms. So don't forget to head over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Right now, the content down there is ad-free, so you can take advantage of that. Don't forget to check out the content I'm releasing on other platforms, such as Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And finally, if you or anyone else you know has a story about anything related to high strangeness, please reach out to me with a brief description to stories at daredevil.com. Thanks again for watching.